it was uh, developed by the Kentucky Transportation Research Program in cooperation with the Federal Highway Administration. In cooperation also with the Federal Highway uh, Administration and will be made available to all 44 T-square centers for them to use in their technology transfer. The highway slide problem is probably one that we know the least amount about in terms of how much does it really cost us to handle the slides on our highway system. Primarily, those slides that become major maintenance problems become major sometime without us even know, knowing why they became major slide problems. We have frequent uh, slide uh, that happens and sometimes we don't know how to measure how much cost is involved in the correction of that slide. We do know that some of them end up as major maintenance problems and it is a continual maintenance problem. The thing that I guess we've discovered most of all that most of the costs are not really uh, identified mainly because we don't budget for them Many times we talk about asphalt patching and it's classified in our uh, budget as uh, asphalt patching when really it should be charged to a correction of a slide. Many of the, the costs are not even known, not only not identified, they're not even known. We also know that there's two kinds of costs because of the slides. We have direct costs and we have indirect costs. Most of the time we know that the slope maintenance is costing, uh, the maintenance of the slope is costing us money, but we don't know how to use that in our budget because sometimes, as indicated earlier, it's not identifiable. When we have to do design work, it becomes identified as a major slide correction. The indirect cost, of course, is those costs that the highway user ends up having to pay because of a restriction in his traffic service and also there are legal lawsuits because of adjacent property owners where a slide encroaches on their property. The thousands of miles of highways that we have, and I would suspect that our Commonwealth of Kentucky probably has as many as any other state. At least the 30 some years that I spent with the highway department in Kentucky, it seems that almost every highway, either local road or state road or city street, that has guardrail, I find myself looking at the guardrail and seeing that common dip and saying, if we don't watch it, we're gonna have a major slide. And for some reason, you wanna stop the car, find some way of jacking it back up so it's level because you know you got a maintenance problem that's gonna keep occurring until you correct that slide. I think most of us would also like to know uh, where did we uh, secure most of the material for this workshop? Most of that came from a report entitled Guidelines for Slope Maintenance and Slide Restoration, which was developed under the auspices of the Federal Highway Administration. And the efforts for this report was uh, six states, California, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Oregon, Texas, and Wyoming. And we have taken this information and have uh, expanded on the information, hopefully to come up with a manual that can be used by county road supervisors and also others that are interested in determining how much and how well can we maintain our slopes to stop the deterioration of the slope. And if we can't stop that deterioration, then how can we restore the slide after it has happened? Going to take a little, small uh, look at the economics of the slope deterioration and the slide problem. There are three states here that we at least uh, identified in the report that had at least could say that uh, they'd spent $960,000 annually. I believe that was Indiana. Another one, I believe was Missouri, was 550000 and then Ohio had at least uh, budgeted for 1.1 million for the correction of their slide problem. Each of those states recognized though and admitted that this did not include all the money that had been used for their slide correction. What role does maintenance play? I know 
our maintenance people mostly say that they inherit all the problems and all the mistakes that uh, planning, design, right away, and utilities and constructions make, make during the, uh, the respective phases. And to some degree, I think that's true. We also know that uh, about 80% to 90% of our mistakes, our human behaviors, result in some of our slides that we have on our highways. This is uh, what could happen, shown in a cartoon fashion, if we don't adequately uh, slow down the deterioration of the slopes. Uh, or you can really see what happens uh, when these kind of things occur in which you don't have to worry about being identified as a major reconstruction problem when this happens. These are some slides to show you the kinds of things that we'll be talking about the rest of the workshop area. For example, this one looks like uh, not too bad a deal, but I think all of you identify that very quickly, that if we don't take some corrective measures with this, you can expect to have this happen, or you can expect to have this happen, and then you're out of, out of the so-called small project into a large major reconstruction area. What is the maintenance involvement? Uh, in terms of uh, stopping or slowing down the, uh, the slope deterioration? And what, what do we have to do if we have to make a major correction? First thing we need to know is uh, how much skill and capabilities do we have in our maintenance crew and our, our maintenance supervisor? Do we have a knowledge of the problems? Have we worked with it before? How much does it cost? And what's the size of the slide? Some people size the slide by virtue of how much money it's going to take to correct it. We are going to try in this uh, to at least identify some parameters and try to size the kind and uh, uh, of slopes that, that we'll be able to, to evaluate and tell how much it's going to cost. For example, less uh, use in this workshop, anything less than 20 feet, we'll call it a small size of the field. Anything 20 to 50 feet, we'll just say medium, and anything over 50 is large. And the same parameters then we'll use for the size of the slide. Less than 20 for small, 20 to 50 medium, and over 50 large. The ability to put these kind of limitations gives us some idea of how to use some cost accounting methods for, the, for determining uh, what's a minor slide, and what's a major slide? And then being able to determine how much of this can a maintenance supervisor cope with. And if he can't cope with it, then he should, of, co of course, if it's in the major area, call his geotechnical engineer and say it's out of my, not, not only out of my budget, it's outside of our capabilities. And also you have to be very, very careful because if you size the uh, correction by virtue of the amount of money and say, well, if it doesn't go over $25,000, uh, we'll call it a small slide. Or if it, setting cost parameters doesn't work too well, it doesn't en enable you to manage your, your, your problem. If, for example, if you had a slide that was 200 feet that was less than 20 feet, or if you had a slide that was only 50 feet that was more than 50 feet, you can't equate the cost for those two because of the differences that you have to take in terms of cost to make the correction. This is the last part of my so-called overview and introduction. If you would just, for example, take your agenda that's handed out, I want to very quickly go over what we will be going over today in the workshop. Gerald, if you could uh, use the overhead camera Maybe we can go over this uh, very quickly. We have just finished, uh, as soon as I'm completed, the introduction, which has contained an overview of background, purpose, and scope. Uh, the next will be slope movements and processes, and uh, our presenter will be uh, Tom Hopkins. Uh, Tom is a research engineer with the Kentucky Transportation Research Program. His major interest is in geotechnical and has worked in the landslide areas. He will cover why and how slopes fail 
examples and movements on slopes and the causes of slope movements. And then we'll have a break. And after the break, we'll go into the third <coughs> part of the workshop, recognition, identification. And you can read this, the subtitles and you can follow these things in your manual as we go, work through the uh, manual today. Terrains, signs of movement, instrumentation, soil, rock, identification. And then we'll have another break. This enables uh, Gerald to uh, change the tapes, but this will be a, a break for us to be able to go to the restroom and take care of other changes in the uh, production of the tapes. The next will be maintenance practices, fourth area, and after that we'll go to lunch. First part of maintenance practices, uh, we'll have uh, Tom back. David Allen will cover the recognition and identification. I forgot to mention that. And then Dave Allen, who is also a chief research engineer with the Kentucky Transportation Research Program. His expertise and experience also is in the geotechnical area. After lunch, we'll come back and we will start, uh, we will finish up the maintenance practices. And then, I, which I consider maybe one of the important parts, the stabilization methods, which I think is uh, what we're all looking at. How can we best handle these uh, and make these corrections? and then we'll have a break and then finish the stabilization area and then a last 15 minute segment we'll talk about uh, legal uh, liabilities and uh, risk management. Tom, uh, if you're ready, we'll uh, let you start with slope movements and processes. Thank you, Kevin. I'd like to first mention that the purpose of this workshop and the manual is intended to provide guidelines for the state, county, and city maintenance su supervisors who are responsible on a daily, daily basis for making decisions related to the maintenance of slopes and slide restoration. In this session, we're going to talk about slope movements and slope processes. I'd like to start this session with the question, what makes slopes move? Just a moment. We have a problem with the slide projector. <coughs> Okay, I'd like to start this session with a question to what makes slopes move? Every maintenance supervisor should ask himself that question whenever he observes, perhaps he's driving along the road and he observes that the uh, guardrail or the uh, bridge railing is slightly skewed or moved, he should ask himself how do slopes move? And why do slopes move? However, this question may be somewhat academic. After he encounters a failure, he could care less probably uh, why the slope's moving. He's more interested in how am I going to fix this particular slide. However, it's good to know why and how slopes move and what causes slopes to move. Because these type of questions uh, when uh, we, we obtain answers to, uh, it, it helps des uh, pavement designers or highway designers in the future. Let's look at a simple slope or highway slope as shown here. When we place materials or a highway embankment on a slope or we build it at a slope, it has a tendency to move downhill. Uh, this movement or tendency to move downhill is 
caused mainly by the force of gravity. Obviously, not, not all highway slopes fail because there's resistant forces, forces that act in opposition to the force of gravity, mainly the strength of the soil and rock. Soil and rock are the types of materials that most highway agencies and people are interested in because that's what's used to build highway embankments. Uh, highway failures usually fail in uh, certain patterns. We have distinctive surfaces and non-distinctive surfaces. Let's look at those. A very common type of uh, highway failure is a circular uh, arc. The mass simply rotates. Or it may be a series of circular arcs. As shown in this slide here, the, toes, uh, the failure occurs in the uh, toe of the embankment. And if it's not repaired, eventually another sl small slip will fail and then it works its way back up to the embankment and eventually the pavement fails. Another common type of failure uh, that we've observed over the many years is a wedge type failure. In this uh, particular type of slide, it's composed of two or three plane surfaces. However, uh, many slides are in cut slopes uh, don't have a, a very distinctive pattern. They just fell in chunks and fall onto the road. Now let's look uh, at some examples of movements on slopes. First of all, we have what we call a mud flow, and this may occur above or below the highway. Uh, in this particular example, this occurs below. And let me note one thing here. We use a notation there we call type A. Now this is a notation that's in the yellow handout and we kept with the uh, notation, the FHWA report TS-85. Uh, this is how uh, the various states uh, assigned a number or a letter to these type slides. Mud flows generally occur in very silty and sandy materials. Usually they're shallow. Uh, they fail oftentimes with little warning. Here's an example of a mud flow. One thing to look for uh, when you see this type of slide is always look to see if water is running over from the pavement down onto the slope. A lot of times uh, this is one of the major causes of the, of the slide. Another thing I'd like to point out on that uh, particular uh, photograph there, there's two distinctive areas in the slide. One at the top are the break in the ground, which we'll call the scarp, and note at the bottom, to the left of the man there, the bulge in the toe. This is very characteristic of a shallow mud flow. Also, make a note of this, at the, uh, the slope of the scarp. If the slope of the scarp is fairly mild, this gives us some clue that the slide is shallow. If it's very deep or near vertical, this gives us a clue that maybe the failure is very deep. In other words, the distinctive shear surface or failure surface that we talked about uh, may reach down tens of feet into the ground. Here's a, just a small uh, mud flow. Note to the right of the tree there, uh, there's a, a scarp and the material is simply slumped down. Usually, if you're in maintenance, you need to check to see if water is running onto the uh, top of the slope there. Oftentimes, the drainage is, is part of the problem. One thing I might add uh, to this particular situation, is oftentimes it's good to travel the road when it's raining because you can see the drainage patterns on the road and see if the water is running onto a slope. And the main thing you want to do is try to divert that water away. This is another type of slide. Uh, well, it's the same type of uh, mud flow, but it occurs above the road. And this is a very common type of slide. Uh, usually these, these type of slides occur in, uh, like I said before, silty and sandy materials and they occur, uh, they're usually shallow uh, most often and they usually occur on very steep slopes. This is a very good example here of a mud flow. Uh, the thing to notice here in this particular type of, of uh, slide is the drainage uh, area there. Because mud flows are very high, highly saturated soils. They need a lot of water. Uh, 
uh, well, that's what, what, what causes the failure. Uh, water gets into the soil mass, uh, it in a sense liquefies, uh, or what happens, it simply loses all its strength and it flows just like water. In this particular slide, the left and right of the, the screen there is sort of a drainage area and it's coming down into the ravine. And so uh, for a mud flow to occur, it needs a lot of water. Here's another example of a mud flow above the road, uh, which has now blocked off the road. You can notice the telephone poles there. Uh, here again, it's a highly saturated mass of material. So this suggests several things, or at least an important uh, thing, is that in situations in slopes where there's a lot of water, we need to try to get, keep the water away from the, uh, from the slope. Another common type of failure that occurs along highways is the wedge failure. We showed that previously. Uh, again, uh, it has a very distinctive scarp, the brown material there or the break in the original ground. Uh, and generally, a, a wedge type failure follows some geological feature. In other words, oftentimes it occurs along bedrock. Uh, it may be a very soft clay seam along that bottom portion or the straight line of the failure mass. So those are some of the characteristics. And these can be very shallow or they may be very deep. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to tell how deep a, this type of slide is. But a clue to the depthness, again, uh, is shown here. Notice that the scarp at the top uh, is somewhat sloping. It kind of gives us an indication that it's not too deep of a failure. But here again, notice that the toe, it's bulged up. These are some very important characteristics for maintenance people they should be able to recognize when they go out and feel. But keep, keep your eye on that scarf because, and the slope of the scarf, because that gives you a clue as to whether it's going to be a big slide or a small slide as far as the quantities of materials involved. <clears throat> some slides, or some wedge slides, are not always easy to figure out what's going on. This is an example here which occurs up in northern Kentucky. That road that you're looking at well, at one time was straight. It was straight through, a straight alignment. Uh, you'll notice that the material and the house there on the right has moved down toward the river. Uh, this occurs on a small county road, and it, it turns out to be a rather large failure, and it turns out to be a wedge failure. But in a situation like this, a maintenance person perhaps will probably have to call in a geotechnical engineer or a person who is trained in, in the mechanics of movements of slopes. That's another view of the slide. Again, the road had straight alignment. You can see it's displaced toward the river. <coughs> Wedge failures also occur below the road, and it's uh, the same as we showed before, except it's occurring below the road. This is a very common problem, a wedge-type failure, uh, on a county road uh, up in the eastern part of Kentucky in a mountainous area. Uh, notice that the river there, or the stream, has eaten into the bank, and what it's doing is undercut, undercutting the toe of the uh, slope there. Uh, and eventually, there's wedge type or small wedges of material slump into the river. So this is one type of wedge. And in, this is a case, this is a major, major wedge type failure. And the reason I like to show this is because it has some very distinctive patterns. Obviously, this is not the type of slide that maintenance would be involved in, although they should be involved in seeing the early symptoms of a slide like this. Uh, in fact, this embankment is some 80 feet measure from the toe up to the top of the embankment. Uh, it's a classic wedge failure. Now, the reason we know that is that we use sophisticated instruments to detect the failure plane. And here's what it looks like in cross-section. In this case, we've got three distinctive planes, an upper uh, plane, which is the dashed line there, then a central plane, and then a small plane at the toe. But this is a classic type wedge failure. 
some wedge failures, though, are, are very difficult to uh, understand. For example, in this slide here, note that the uh, mass material at the top of slope has uh, fallen down, slid or slumped, and exposing the bridge piling. However, if you look at the toe of the slide, the material is humped up, and it's slid uh, along some small or along some clay seam, probably a few feet or several feet down. Uh, we'll talk about what causes these type of failures because this originally, uh, initially was a lake around that and someone decided they wanted to do some repairs on a road and they lowered the water table, I mean lowered the lake and caused what we call a rapid drawdown condition and we'll discuss that later in some of the sessions. A characteristic of a, of a wedge type failure, uh, oftentimes if you see a vertical crack at the top of the slope, the scarp which has, in this shot, hasn't developed, but it's getting ready to develop, is nearly vertical. This indicates that it's a very deep failure. Another, and probably one of the most common types of slides that we see along highway, is what we call a slide above the road, a rotational failure. And these occur, of course, both above and below the road. Rotational failures are very, usually rotational failures are, are, are occur in somewhat homogeneous materials. Um, a, an example of a small rotational failure above the road in a cut slope uh, is shown here. Notice that the scarf uh, is uh, almost vertical. Actually, this particular slide here has two features we might note. It's rotational, but also it's a mud flow, if you can see in the center of the screen there. Rotational slides, of course, occur below the road which is a very common uh, type of highway failure. They also may occur, or the failure plane may pass through only the fill material, or they may pass through the original ground, as shown here. Uh, note the circular failure arc there. Uh, usually when this type of slide, usually the failure arc passes through a very soft, uh, weak foundation soil, and that's what causes the slide. Uh, another type of, uh, or another, uh, example of a rotational failure. The, uh, notice the scarf at the top, it's uh, nearly vertical, and it's uh, uh, probably a very deep failure in this particular situation. Uh, this particular slide is another example of a rotational failure, and perhaps maintenance people should frame this. I'll be glad to send you a photograph. Frame this and send it to highway embankment designers. The reason I say that, notice the water at the toe of this slide. But the important thing here is, why do we build ditches at the toe of slides so that water can pond? Well, I don't know. I think we ought to, uh, when we're designing highways, we ought to look and try to get the ditch five or 10 feet away from the toe of the field. Uh, it, this would help avoid a situation like this. Of course, maintenance is faced with the problem that they've got to do something about that pond and water. And if we could locate ditches a few feet away from the tow, perhaps the problem wouldn't be as severe. What happens in a situation like this is the water ponds there, softens the material, the strength of the material weakens, and we get a rotational failure. This could be prevented, both from a design point of view, but also from a maintenance point of view. This is a very large failure. Uh, it's not a type of slide that maintenance would be involved in necessarily, because it is an enormous failure. It's a, uh, essentially a rotational failure. However, maintenance should be able to detect early warning signs that something's going on, how this slope is moving, and why is it moving. This is another example. It's a little difficult to tell whether it's a rotational failure or just simply a flow. Uh, the depth of it is, is difficult because uh, if you can see the top of the scarp there, it looks like it started out to be a rotational fail failure in that the, the scarp is nearly vertical, but then it begins to uh, slope a little bit. It kind of suggests here, and it is, 
this uh, just a, a small wedge type failure, although it started out as a, a rotational failure, but it's fell in about two to five feet below the surface. Notice the bulge at the toe, those and the scarf at the top, those are two very distinctive features of landslides, of rotational failures. This type of slide, a block slide, is a very dangerous type slide because it can fail without warning. And this is something that maintenance should be very aware of. For example, here's a particular slide. The bottom of the slope has been displaced by about six inches. At the top, the top of the uh, block has fallen down some six to 12 inches. And that's what we call the uh-oh squad of geotechnical engineering, uh, trying to decide what to do. Obviously, maintenance would not necessarily be involved in a, in a landslide this large, but yet they might be able to detect early warning signs. And if you can detect early signs of failure, oftentimes you can do things that'll save money. This is a very common type rock uh, failure. We, we have what we call differential weathering, and what we have here is a situation where we have uh, maybe a hard material, the lighter material there, and a very soft material. And what happens is that this, the brown material is on your screen there uh, weathers much faster than the harder material. Now, the harder material could be something like limestone or sandstone or whatever. But what happens is the brown material or, or the soft material weathers rather fast, uh, it undercuts the support for the harder material, and the harder material then is hanging or projecting out, and it simply, with the action of water uh, and freeze and thaw, chunks of it start falling down onto the highway. This is a very dangerous situ situation, especially if the slope is located very close to the highway. Uh, a maintenance person should be very aware of this problem, uh, especially if he's had to go out there and clean rock two or three times uh, clean it up and, and move it out. He should notify uh, geotechnical and geologists about this problem in the state. Uh, if he's in a county, he should probably uh, call in a geotechnical engineer or a geologist. This is an illustration of what we're talking about here. Uh, you can see in this particular shot that we've got a harder material uh, resting on top of a, a softer material. And note that the softer material has weathered much faster than the limestone above it, the limestone cap. So chunks of it have fallen down into the paved ditch. Now, this particular problem, uh, of course, creates a lot of headaches for maintenance. They've got to come out there and clean those ditches out. Another example of a massive uh, failure uh, due to differential weathering, if you notice in the bottom of the screen, just above the roadway there, uh, there's a clay shale type material there that's weathered faster. Uh, it's undercutting the support for the harder material of the sandstone. Just another view of a massive block type failure that's uh, 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 due to differential weathering. Other type of failures occur, uh, we call rock, fo rock fall from massive rock slopes. Uh, this is a pre-split slope. Usually we don't have these type problems with pre-split slopes, but in this example, notice the projecting rock or the overhand, overhanging rock, uh, eventually those chunks of rock will fall down in a very non-distinctive failure pattern uh, and create a problem for maintenance. Rock fall from a talus slope, this is another type of, of failure that occurs. Uh, talus essentially is a mixture or a matrix of fine grain soils mixed with chunks of rock. Uh, the fine grain material in the talus slope controls the properties or the strength of the material. Uh, it's usually a lot weaker than the rock itself. And uh, one thing that causes this type of slide is you get a lot of groundwater flowing through it uh, or uh, snow melt, rainfall onto the slope, and eventually the material ends up uh, down at the bottom as is shown here in this example. Or it may look something like this, where you get a massive failure that moves on the highway. Here again, maintenance may not be able to correct, uh, or, uh, well, they'll essentially be involved in, uh, sometimes in having to come out and clean up this type of material. Now let's turn our attention to what causes landslides. 
And we'll try to keep this fairly non-technical. Uh, causes? Well, we need to know something about the causes of landslides. First of all, we talked about uh, gravity or as being one of the chief causes. There's other causes, both man-made things that we can control, and there's types of forces that we can't control. For example, this is a, a, a slope where a house has been loaded or built on top. This brings gravity into play more. It adds weight to the top of the slope, which drive, is a driving force. There's other, other type of forces, earthquakes, which we have no control over, uh, side casting, water, and water in the forms of rainfall, floods, and erosion. Earthquakes, well, we can't predict uh, when an earthquakes are going to occur, but when they do in certain areas of the country, they can uh, really cause a lot of failures, such as in Alaska or California or even here in Kentucky on occasion. Side casting. To the left of that slope, or uh, to the top of this slope, is a large slope. Falls off to your left on the screen there. Uh, when we side cast or we take material and put a uh, place at the top of the slope, we're adding driving weight to the top of the slope. We're adding weight to the slide or a potential slide. If we're going to clean ditches, rock falls, let's place the material at the toe of the slope where it'll do most good because that adds resistant forces to the, uh, to the uh, slope. Now, one thing that maintenance could do is in situations like this, set up storage areas. Or if you have a problem in a highway field, uh, you could uh, place, uh, place it where you've got some sediment, place that waste material to the toe of the field. Now, sometimes it may be necessary to place uh, material at the top of the slope, but when you have to place material like this in order to maintain the grade, you should start looking for the causes because the top of the slope has settled. Anytime we add weight, and this is what I'm trying to illustrate, anytime we add weight to the top of the slope, we're increasing the driving forces. We're trying to cause the thing to fail. Water is another problem. It's a major problem in landslides, and practically all landslides usually involve some form of water. Water adds weight to the, to the failure mass, or the mass is trying to fail, um, and it also decreases the strength of the material when it's inside the, the uh, uh, field material. Flooding is another problem. This causes, can cause a, a slope failure, and we'll talk about that more in detail later on. Erosion at the toe. Well, what we do there, we bring the force of gravity into play more. We, make, we steepen the slope in a sense. Just an example of erosion, if you notice the ditches uh, near the toe there, this is the type of thing that should be recognized and some corrective action taken, uh, either adding material at the toe or whatever, and we'll talk about that in a later session, of types of things we can do to correct this type of situation. Here's an illustration of a slope where the water is eroding at the top. Uh, you notice the rocks projecting out over the road. Here again, water is a major factor causing uh, can, that can uh, create a situation where a landslide can occur. Other factors, large deformations, weather, and in quick conditions. Um, let me talk about the first two. If we deform, or if material under its own weight deforms, uh, to a large degree, that weakens the material, and failure can result. We talked about weathering, and weathering basically is the breaking apart of the material uh, as it uh, freezes and thaws and rainfall and snow melt gets on it. Uh, it breaks apart and simply starts falling down. So to summarize, we have a stable slope if the resisting force or the strength of the material is greater than the driving forces, and we talked about driving forces, uh, the gravity force, uh, flooding and water, and those type of things. Uh, if the resisting forces are less than driving forces, we have an unstable slope. That concludes this session. on the recognition and identification. We're going to talk about instrumentation just for a minute. That starts on page 49 in your manual. 
Uh, we won't get into a great detail on this because we are we feel that most maintenance people probably will not be too actively involved in it. The reason we're discussing this is just simply to introduce you to uh, some of the instruments that are used to determine movements and locations of slides and to make you aware of the fact that these things need to be cared for and need to be protected and uh, uh, they're often very expensive instruments and very difficult to replace. Matter sometimes when they're torn out or through uh, construction or maintenance activities, they simply can't be replaced and data is lost. So we'll look just briefly at some of the instruments that are involved. First of all, there's something we know as piezometers, and we've told you already that water is so important, and uh, we often need to know where water is located in a moving mass. We need to know if it's a high water table or a low water table or whatever, and piezometers are instruments that are used to uh, help us determine what that water pressure is and what the equivalent head is, and uh, so we uh, install these in a well casing, something similar to this. Uh, we drill down with a drill rig, we seal the bottom of it with some kind of a uh, sealer or clay or something of that nature. We'll install our piezometer and backfill it with sand or something like that, and then seal the top of it, and we'll backfill the hole. We have tubes and electrical cables, whichever the case may be. In most cases, the tubes that come out of the uh, piezometer, and we have uh, instrumentation that can read that water pressure. This is just a picture of some of the instrumentation that, uh, or the control panel that reads that. Gives us the location and the pressure of the water that's in the landslide. These uh, are installed again, in, uh, usually in casings or have casings that come out of the hole that help protect them. Slope inclinometers. These are very important. It's a technology that's been around 20 or 25 years or something like that. But uh, slope inclinometers have a tendency, or they're something that you install again with a drill crew, a drill rig, install uh, a plastic uh, grooved casing into a drill hole and backfill it either with grout or gravel or something of that nature. Uh, we have a torpedo, what's called a torpedo. If you notice in the center of this picture, it's a silver looking thing that's inserted down into the casing that rides in the grooves uh, with a long electrical cable that's on this reel you see in the picture here. Uh, that torpedo measures the slope of that casing. It measures how much it's moved. You, by the data that you get, you can tell how much it's moved, where it's moving, and the rate of movement from this instrument. So these are often used in landslide areas. Again, there's another photograph of a uh, technician reading the uh, inclinometer and uh, determining what's going on at the slide site. Those are more expensive uh, instruments. Uh, they're often at construction sites or, on, or maintenance sites. They are flagged. They're often be fence posts around them or they'll be flagged and special care should be taken that these aren't destroyed. We had one project recently, we lost $5,000 worth of instrumentation simply because some construction personnel were not very careful and uh, that's very expensive and very time consuming to lose those. Some more simple methods if, uh, if you don't have these uh, instruments available and many people do not, you can simply uh, just do ground surveys. So come out in a moving area or an area you think is unstable Establish several lines of uh, survey lines, uh, put in some stakes or hubs or steel pins or whatever you wish to do, uh, and uh, survey these into a straight line, measure levels or, or elevations on them, come back six months or however often you want to monitor it. Uh, again, survey the same stakes, uh, see how much they've moved, uh, see how much the elevations have changed, get some idea of the extent of the moving area or get some idea how quickly it's moving or how, uh, what the elevation changes are. Some other simple methods that we can use uh, for determining, again, the water table elevation. This is important. As I said a few minutes ago, we can just simply install water wells. Uh, this is plastic casing in this photograph here. You can actually use downspout. Some people use just plain old downspout for guttering. Uh, install again in a drill hole, uh, backfilled around it with soil or sand or something of this nature, and you can simply put a probe down in it. Some people actually tie a string to a rock and put that down until they hear it hit the water uh, elevation. It's a very simple method. Don't drop rocks in it because it fills it up, but uh, at least uh, tie a string to a rock until you hear where the uh, rock hits the water level, and that way you can tell the elevation of the water table. These are just very simple methods. Again, some in uh, lieu of an expensive slope inclinometer, you can install downspout or some kind of pipe, again, in a moving mass. Uh, and uh, ever so often come back and see if the uh, uh, pipe has moved uh, by, again, putting 
uh, a rock on a string or inserting something in that pipe and see how far down it goes uh, before it's blocked or before it closes off. That'll give you an indication of where uh, the movement is taking place as well. These are just simple methods of instrumentation. Now, <clears throat> another thing that we can use are just simple measurements of cracks or measurements of movements. Uh, if you've got cracks taking place in your pavement, come out in, on frequent intervals, uh, measure the length of it or measure the width of it and give you some idea if the movement's still taking place or how much it's happening. Very simple, doesn't cost much money, just a little personnel time. Of course, personnel is expensive, but just a little personnel time and uh, you can get some idea of what's going on at, at an unstable site. And one very quick thing before we, excuse me, yes. One of the comments that I would make in here, people to stress in this section is that these instruments are installed to function for a long, long period of time. And just because maintenance people see them out there for years and years and years doesn't mean that they should be torn out or the uh, protection and fencing should be torn down. Uh, also, if they find damage to the instruments, the maintenance people will be the first ones to notice vandalism. They shouldn't just let that go unnoticed. They should report that immediately to the geotechnical people so the instrument can be reestablished and readings can continue. Mm -hmm. Very good point, and I uh, would like to agree uh, again with what he has said. These are long-term uh, instruments, and uh, there are in some cases we ourselves have had them in for 15 years. So they're very long-term instruments, and uh, need to be cared for indefinitely uh, as long as uh, until maintenance people are told otherwise. Uh, in our uh, discussion on soil and rock, there are s several things that are important. Uh, we're talking about the, particularly soils here because landslides occur most often in soil. Uh, there are several types of basic characteristics of soils that uh, influence the behavior of it. Uh, for those of you who are not very familiar with soil, uh, some soils generally are coarse grain, classified as coarse grained or fine grained soils. And uh, coarse grain soils usually consist of gravels, uh, uh, fine or sands, uh, fine sands. Uh, uh, then we have the medium sized coarse grains, which would be, would be silt. And finally, we have fine grain soils, which are usually classified as clays. Now, usually, uh, uh, clays are the most problem in soils. Uh, in landslides, at least in the eastern portion of the country. Uh, the clays are very susceptible to water. They are very susceptible to creeping and movement. These are fine, so fine grain that you can't identify the soil grains by the naked eye, whereas you could with in granular soils, you could see the grains, individual grains. Clays, you cannot see them, and they are very susceptible to movement. The various things affect these. Again, the, the grain size, the natural moisture content, as you see the slide here, affects the uh, uh, behavior of a landslide, how quickly it moves, uh, if the soil is saturated, if it's uh, very wet, if it's above uh, uh, what we would call the plastic limit, and I'm not going to get into that. If you're familiar with that term, the plastic limit is where the soil begins to creep under its own weight or it's highly moldable. That's the moisture content at which that occurs. If the moisture content is above that, chances are your soil is unstable and you'll have some problems. The unit weight, of course, is very uh, important in determining the behavior of a landslide. The heavier a soil is, obviously, the more driving forces there are. That's also an important uh, uh, idea and important factor in the soils that you have to take into account. Now, this is just, I just, again, briefly wanted to mention those about the behavior of the soil. We're going to go in right on into uh, another section here. This is maintenance practices. This is, starts on page 61 of your manual. Uh, I'm going to have Tom Hopkins come back and give us the first section here talking about inventory of slope problems. But maintenance and their normal everyday practice can have a lot of influence on whether a slide is, is uh, made worse or if it's uh, uh, stopped or if it's slowed or whatever. What they do is important. And what they, how they uh, handle a landslide or how they handle an unstable soil mass is so critical as to whether that thing will stabilize or move in the future. So one of the first things we want to talk about, uh, I'm going to have Tom to mention it here, is inventory in some of these problems. Uh, maintenance people can go a long way in helping us out in that area. So Tom, if you'll come and...
So Dave talked about uh, earlier, we talked about uh, distress signs and pre-slide symptoms on the highway. Uh, one of the things that highway maintenance engineers or supervisors should do is maintain a slide inventory of these problems. Uh, and also in inspection reports, there should be a written report. And these, should be, uh, these type of things should be maintained in the files. Uh, what's the purpose? Well, by looking at pre-slide symptoms, he can, uh, the maintenance supervisor can evaluate the condition of a highway slope. Uh, also, any drainage structures that are located to slope, uh, near slopes uh, should be noticed and notes made of. What are the benefits? Well, there's a lot of benefits that can be uh, obtained from this. And later on this afternoon, I'm going to show you a case history in the latter session, how uh, someone looks at a uh, particular class of slope problems and comes up with a very uh, good solution to it. First, this, uh, first benefit uh, the inventory can do is it, it helps identify potential slides. Uh, if we're particularly aware of the potential uh, pre-slide symptoms, uh, sometimes we can start doing things early and start planning. Another thing is it defines the scope of the slide or potential slide. Uh, also, the inventory can help trace the progression of a slide. Some landslides occur or the movements may occur over a period of 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, that's a long time. So by keeping track and keeping notes from year to year of what's happening at a particular section, uh, we can start doing some pre-planning uh, in this regard. Second, if you inventory particular sections of the highway, you can establish a priority program for allocating funds. Uh, in other words, you'll probably end up trying to treat your most serious problems first. But one thing we've noticed in highways that a, a landslide or a potential landslide, I should say, it may just show some pre-slide symptoms uh, today, but four or five years from now, it may fail. So if we're aware of looking at these symptoms uh, and know and classify the different sections of highway, especially the distress sections, then we can start seeing how we should allocate our funds for repairs. Other benefits, well, as I've just talked about, we get historical data. This is really, really important for the geotechnical engineer. If you have to call in a geotechnical consultant or, uh, or consult with the state's geotechnical staff, having this historical data is a real, real important thing because he doesn't have to do a lot of the footwork. Uh, a lot of times he, he's a very busy person uh, and uh, he'll have to go out and get that data. But if you've got it in the file, you can hand him a folder if it's a large slide that we're dealing with and he can review it quickly. Another thing is that it opens up communications. And I think this is uh, very, very important between the maintenance supervisors, maintenance personnel and geotechnical staff. Uh, also, uh, one of the big comments that Dave and I encountered when we were putting together this course, we don't have enough money to repair landslides. Well, with an inventory system and, a, and uh, by classifying your problem and having the data, it's a lot easier to go in to some administrator and convince him that you need future funds if you've got your homework done. So this is a way of doing homework. And finally, the most important thing, it gives you a course of action. It organizes you in the sense that you can uh, decide what am I going to do, which slides am I going to treat first, and so on. One thing that we would recommend uh, from this course is that maybe periodically maintenance people and geotechnical engineers, <coughs> like on a state level, get together. Have a joint review of some of the data. Uh, this would help a lot in establishing priorities uh, for maintenance. One place we could start, perhaps, is to start reviewing maintenance records, uh, maintenance cost. Uh, every locality should es establish some type of uh, uh, inventory 
uh, and also take a look at what problems are occurring. For example, uh, we might start by looking where there's numerous overlays. This is an indication uh, that uh, maybe there's certain distress session, uh, sections uh, occurring that possibly landslide problems are developing. By looking at these uh, places, for example, if, if we've uh, patched the place for two or three times, we've probably got a, a, a slide problem developing, uh, most likely, because that embankment settled several inches. So look at numerous overlays in this joint review. Pavement cracks, as Dave talked about earlier. Uh, this is an indication that maybe some real serious problems are going to develop. Make notes in the inventory where those cracks are occurring. Previous slide repairs. Uh, just because you go out and repair a landslide, don't assume that it's going to stay there. Failures occur after you repair them. So d uh, don't make the assumption that because you maybe you let something out to a contractor that he's an expert in landslides, he repaired it, I have no more problems there. Always go back in the inventory system and review that slide. Keep a track because, like I say, sometimes landslides take 10 or 15 years to move. Should be a periodic inspection. Uh, we would look at those first three, three things first. Maybe the joint review would look at uh, fill and cut slopes. Uh, in setting up the inventory system, uh, we probably would want to set some criteria there, critical steepness of the slope and height. What we would recommend, any embankment over 50 feet uh, in height, and we're talking about uh, from measured, uh, measuring the height from the toe of the field up to the top of the slope, uh, as the distance we're talking about here, anything over 50 feet and anything less than two horizontal to one vertical slope probably should be uh, included in the, in the record because large fields settle a lot, but oftentimes this is where we have some of our major problems. And this could be a two-lane county road that, goes, that has a slope that goes 50, uh, could be 50 feet in height. And another thing that should be included in the inventory system is all drainage features, as Dave talked about earlier. Uh, and of course, all known uh, slides and slip outs and rock falls should be included. And you should have in your record or have a, a, a mechanism where you can have a schedule for updates on those. Now, in your manual, uh, sec, uh, Appendix A, is pre-slide symptoms and so forth. This part of the a manual can be pulled out by the maintenance personnel and carried in the truck. It gives you some uh, information on things to look for and so on. Uh, of course, after you do the inventory, you should classify the landslide. Uh, very serious, serious, medium, uh, or minor, whether uh, on the condition of the slope. Uh, a very serious problem, of course, would be one where the uh, pavement or the embankment is dropped six inches and it's a very hazard to the traffic. Obviously, a case like this needs a lot of quick or needs a lot of attention and you're going to have to do something fast. Uh, a serious problem may be one that you've patched four or five times. Uh, it needs some type of investigation conducted. And possibly, or probably, most likely, you're going to have to uh, repair the, the embankment slope. Medium, well, you need to take a close, keep a close uh, check on, this, on the embankment. Uh, maybe you passed it once. Uh, maybe there's a slight crack or a little bit of movement on the guardrail. So it should be included in your inventory system, and one that you keep your eye on. Uh, minor, uh, well, that'd just be maybe uh, a of patching the surface or something of maybe one, one patch in two. It, uh, but uh, you would have to come up with your own sort of system, but this is one suggested way of looking at uh, or classifying the condition of a slope. Things that you could include on the slide inventory uh, inspection report or just things, these are listed in your manual, location data, Make a note of where it, where it is. Uh, it's so many miles from some uh, uh, known feature or, uh, or a mile post number or something of that type. Uh, type of slide. Now, I'd like to mention one thing that in your appendix, we've included a sample slide inventory inspection report. This is just a sample. Uh, you may have to massage this 
to food, fit your own particular local conditions. Uh, but the type of slides we talked about earlier in one of the earlier session uh, are in that inventory. And uh, so you could simply circle, if you can guess, or if you, if you uh, study this enough, you could probably uh, get familiar with the typical slides and be able to mark it. Uh, other contributing factors, uh, other things that you may note, uh, as shown here, uh, whether it's a bulge at the toe or a scarp, uh, cattails growing, as Dave mentioned earlier, at the toe there. Uh, it's good to make, make a sketch of the site and, and, and measure these things, put them on a sketch and indicate there. Because later on when we talk about subsurface waters and how to treat that, cattails and signs of springs, that gives you an indication where you might start trying to make a repair and something to do or try to lower the groundwater table in the slide. Uh, other things is if it's above the roadway, you need to make an indication in the form. Uh, the, and as we mentioned earlier, the type of slide above the road, uh, whether it's a mud flow or so on. Uh, other inspection data, which is listed in your man, uh, manual. Rate of movement, Dave talked about simple things we could do. Uh, measuring cracks and uh, periodically measuring the width of the crack gives you an indication how fast the thing's moving. Uh, what effect it might, uh, if the thing fell, what effect would it have on the roadway? Uh, would it endanger the public in some form or whatever? Uh, whether there's utilities located close to the site, such as telephone poles, these are kinds of data that should go on the form. Uh, whether adjacent properties would be involved, in other words, uh, uh, is there a $10 million building sitting at the top of the slope? These are the kinds of things you should indicate. And uh, any other type of maintenance activity. And then, like I say, you should make additional notes and sketches. Uh, a good thing to do is take photographs. Uh, you may want to try to get cross sections of the highway embankment. Uh, you may not include all of this data in there, but at least include some of it. It's preferable, of course, to include all the data and estimate repair cost. Well, we're going to give, a, after a while, a later session, give you a real quick way, just giving a quick estimate of what it would cost if this main bank would fail, what it would cost to repair it. And then you should do a follow-up report. A simple thing is do a profile or uh, take a cross-section. Uh, this is a simple way of, of estimating how deep the failure is. Uh, the details of this technique is explained in your manual. Uh, there's useful things for, useful items for inspection that you, when you make an inspection, things you should take along. Of course, you should take a notepad. This sounds a little bit crazy, but uh, you'll be surprised how often I go out sometimes and forget to take the things I need. A notepad to take notes and make sketches. You need a camera. This is one of the most important items you can take on an inspection, and I'd like to really emphasize this. Taking, and, and also, when you take Take shots, mount slides, you can either do slides or photographs. Slides are convenient, and one good thing about taking landslides, if you have this joint review and you have slides, but when you get together, you can talk with the geotechnical staff uh, and the maintenance supervisor, the maintenance engineers can get together. Well, they can flip through and show land, uh, slides of the uh, problem so that the uh, peop both, both groups can get a, mag uh, get a feeling for the magnitude of the problem. Uh, take some well-placed photographs. For example, uh, this is a system that's used in Kentucky by the geotechnical branch of uh, the Kentucky Department of Highways. Uh, they came up with a scheme of using a number. They painted large numbers. So they show, a, 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 they take a good shot of the pavement. You can notice there's dips in the guardrail there. Well, that's significant. That's showing something there. Take a shot of the slope. You, know, you may have to walk several feet, hundreds of feet back to get a wide angle shot like that. But it's good to get a good shot there. You see the man in the photograph there, he's standing on the top of a scarf there. There's a slight break in the ground there. That's highly significant. And this photograph shows that fairly well. Uh, drainage structures. Here again, he's at the same location. Uh, he's, the slide is numbered. An, uh, another shot of the drainage there. Uh, it's difficult to see in that shot, but if you look in the lower part of the inlet there, there's mud there. That's very significant. That means maybe the pipe's broken, possibly, and mud is oozing from 
from inside the embankment down through the joint into the pipe, a cloth tape. That is one of the most important things to take because when you're looking at a, a, a distress section where there's slight movement, a little failure's occurred, you want to measure the width of it. Another useful item is a hand level. You may want to take a quick cross section, and this is something that maintenance could learn to do. Take a real quick cross section because taking that cross section, you can uh, possibly pick up the bulge where a bulge may be occurring in the toe of the embankment. And of course, the compass gives you the direction which you can note the north arrow on the slide. One suggestion, and I don't think maintenance would be involved in this, but it's something that maintenance and other people should think about, is setting up a system which you could take the sample form in the, the manual, computerize the data, so it'd be very simple. You can make a formatted form for maintenance to carry out. They could fill it in and then type it in, then, and then you could easily update these, these slides. Uh, like I say, that's not a, 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 a real concern, maybe perhaps to the maintenance supervisor, He's got other problems on his hand, but it's something that other people in the uh, state should uh, be aware of. And finally, we need to uh, have in this type of system some type of central control, or central review uh, authority. There needs to be a mechanism set up where people can get together periodically and review all these maintenance problems. Okay, I'm gonna turn the program at this point back over to Dave Allen. We're still under maintenance practices. Uh, we're going to begin on page 70 in your manual under slope maintenance. Now what we're about to discuss are some suggestions that we would have for maintenance people. Uh, these are just, we'll show some examples from the slides and sketches here of some of the situations that we've found or we have collected here, and some suggestions for maintenance people to do in the situations like these. First of all, we're gonna talk about maintenance of the slopes themselves. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, if you've got an erosion problem, how are we gonna do this? What do we need to look at when we uh, are going through on our maintenance activities? Uh, we have an erosion problem, what are some of the things we need to maintain or take care of? For instance, this is an example here in this slide of an interception ditch. This is at the top of a slope. One thing that most people, I believe, are not fully aware of is how uh, uh, delicate or how fragile, a, really, a soil slope is. And uh, interception ditches, for instance, are used to uh, stop erosion, to keep the water from going over the slope or running down over the slope. And these things, uh, when maintenance people go out and look at these things, need to be aware of the fact that, hey, Let's look at this. Is there a crack in this? If it's a, uh, just a small crack, maybe we can stop it, keep water from going down in it and eroding out underneath of it. Uh, let's look at that a little more closely. This is one thing they need to examine. Look, for instance, at this one. Uh, this is a maintenance problem. The only thing that probably can be done with this particular paved trench now is to remove it. And either if you don't want to repave it, which would be a major job, at least put large stone back in the ditch. This probably is going to, this will get worse. There's no doubt about it. This will get worse. Maintenance need to come in and just simply try to stop it, try to slow it down by putting large stone in it, either removing the trench or the ditch completely and replacing it with stone or else uh, probably let a contract and have it replaced. Uh, these ditches uh, are so important. Any amount of water that gets under a paved ditch is going to begin to create a problem. And the first crack that gets in a paved ditch, that water is going to water is going to find its way into it and down under that ditch. Here's just another picture of one that needs to be worked on. Uh, again, the only thing about only thing you can do with this without too much expensive uh, repair is simply replace it and just put large stone in it. And uh, here's one that's totally uh, eroded away. Uh, the, notice the pond of water standing here. There are two ditches that came into this point here, uh, and the situation is critical here. And it needs to be come in and drained, and about the only thing that could be done here in this situation, again, is either to repair the ditch to its original shape by paving a new one, or else come in and remove the water and just simply fill it with large stone. 
Here's a situation uh, that uh, the whole uh, first section of a pipe has been eroded out. Uh, the pipe is, the, notice the tree growing up next to it there, and the pipe is simply, the first section is about to lose it, possibly even the head wall. The thing to do there is, of course, to come in, again, I would su suggest granular material here, come in and backfill around this and uh, smooth the slope out, either with a little bit of soil on top of the granular material and reseed it, or else uh, something of that nature. But this needs to be uh, corrected immediately else uh, the situation will get worse, the slope will get unstable, you'll lose more of your pipe, and uh, you'll have a major repair problem there. I showed this slide a while ago, but uh, just to reemphasize, this needs to be uh, refilled, again, probably with granular material, possibly a, an asphalt coat on top of it, as it originally was, and more importantly, some sort of drainage needs to be provided there. And I'll talk a little bit more about bridge end drainage in a few minutes. But some kind of drainage to prevent that erosion from occurring again needs to be provided. A pipe, uh, a paved flume, or something of that nature to carry the water from the end of the bridge. Here's a situation where the toe of a slope was eroded out by the uh, uh, forces of the river. This was on the outside of a curb of a river uh, where the big truck is there. You'll see that there was a large, or there was, before the maintenance got a hold of it, there was a large hole there. Uh, where the current, an eddy current, had eaten out the toe of the embankment. This embankment was moving. Matter of fact, it was a critical situation, and one of the problems was the fact that erosion had removed the toe support, and as I, as I said a while ago, you remove the toe support, you remove the, or you increase the likelihood of uh, a landslide occurring, so they came in and filled this with large granular material that would not be susceptible to erosion by the stream current. Here's sheet erosion, what I call sheet erosion. This is along the edge of a pavement where simply the water that comes off of the pavement uh, washes over the shoulder. The shoulder has been partially stabilized in the past, but the uh, stabilization has uh, uh, still continued to allow the soil underneath to erode, and we get a situation like this. Now, this water is going to continue to erode the embankment further on down, either saturate the embankment or cause further or deeper gullies on the slope and possibly destabilize the slope. This again, these gullies need to be filled in and uh, some sort of uh, stabilization put on that shoulder. And uh, again, an asphalt uh, uh, overlay or an asphalt uh, uh, chip seal or something of that nature to hold it, the soil in place. Here's a, a sh uh, shoulder here that had been subjected to sheet erosion and they've simply come in and uh, put some uh, thin concrete, some grout, and spread it over the slope to prevent any further erosion at this point. Now here's the situation, if you notice across the center of the picture, the guardrail on the lower uh, roadway here, there is a, a, a small berm there, an asphalt berm. These are very, very important uh, to repair. These uh, berms keep the water that's coming off of your pavement from flowing down over the slope, and particularly in, in a uh, curved section or a super elevated section where you're getting the water from the entire paved surface. Oftentimes you if you let the water run over that slope, you get the situation that I showed just a second ago, that erosion. Uh, these uh, asphalt or concrete uh, berms, or not berms, but uh, curbs here, keep the water from going down over the slope and preventing that erosion that you see. This way you can channel the water to one location and uh, run it down a paved flume or a paved ditch to the toe of the slope. Here's in an urban area. Notice this uh, curb drain here is not doing much good. Uh, it may be catching some of the water in real heavy flow, but if you'll notice that the slab, the uh, concrete slab, has settled relative to the curb, uh, most of the water is going down around that curb and down underneath of it, and you can see that the pavement there is not in real good shape, probably because of the water that's going underneath. What needs to be done there is this crack needs to be repaved. Uh, the, uh, an asphalt overlay probably would be the cheapest thing to do there and bring that up to at least the grade of the gutter and to seal that area. So just a little sketch here to show us the interception ditches are important, repair the curbs or the, or the, uh, that I showed you there in the city or out uh, the curb to keep the water from going over the slope. Uh, any area that maintenance gets out in and tries to uh, repair or makes repairs on, if they have to disturb the slope and leave uh, just bare soil there that needs to be reseeded and repaired. These are things, just simple things that uh, maintenance can do to help uh, in the stabilization of slopes. 
Here's a, uh, we will talk just a minute about vegetation and how it can help us out. Here's a slope here that is not properly seeded. Notice uh, the erosion that's already started to take place. This is a fairly new slope, but uh, erosion has already started to take place. There are two diagonal lines going across the picture there, there down across that slope. Notice there are gullies that are forming. And notice where those gullies come down on the steeper portion of the cut. They've already uh, started a fairly steep erosion problem there. Now, what's going to happen is those gullies are going to get deeper and uh, there are going to be some small slides and slumps that occur across that slope. So, so maintenance, as they find this, need to come back. If the thing was not seeded properly in the beginning, then it needs to be reseeded and uh, hopefully to stop the erosion. Here's another problem with erosion and improper seeding. This slope here was not properly seeded. Not only do we see small gullies that are starting on that slope, notice what's happening there at the mouth of the, or the inlet of that culvert. It's beginning to fill, to, fill up and silt up, and before too long we'll have a, a blocked culvert and more water standing at the toe, and the situation just simply gets worse. So again, maintenance should come back, make sure that's reseeded, and uh, come back and clean that culvert out and uh, try to stop the erosion at that point. Here's just an example, everyone's seen this, but this is a type of netting and straw and seeding that helps to hold slopes. Here's another slope that has been just recently repaired. Notice it's uh, covered with straw and a stabilizer, in this case a net, that uh, helps to hold the soil and the seed in place until some form of sod gets started. So anytime maintenance does any kind of work like this, it would disturb the soil and leave bare soil out, then they should come back and reseed it very carefully. Uh, here's another interesting thing. Now, we've talked about cattails earlier this morning uh, being an indication of where water is. You can use sometimes plants to, uh, this is one that's probably not thought of very often, but maintenance can use plants sometimes to help a landslide situation. Uh, these water-loving plants, cattails and willow trees and other things that like water, if you've got a small area that uh, is uh, soft or muddy, uh, but the area is maybe is not moving yet, you can stabilize that area or help to stabilize that area by planting some of these uh, shrubs or some of these bushes and weeds and help to, to uh, absorb some of the excess water that's coming at a site. Some people have used this and it works mostly in small areas where you have just small muddy areas. Here's a, a ditch here that obviously we've shown several of these pictures already this morning, but notice as you go around the curve to the right there, there is a blockage of vegetation. That's too much vegetation in the ditch. Uh, they have it, the vegetation has blocked the ditch. We know that it is important to have vegetation to avoid uh, erosion if you don't have a paved ditch, but this is too much. And maintenance could alleviate this ponding water here by coming in and cutting some of that vegetation out, letting the water go on down grade around the curve. Here's a one, I showed this as an example of just exactly what good vegetation is. There's a small culvert there, if you can see it uh, up to the top right of the picture. Uh, notice in the bottom of the flow line here, you can see some water flowing there. There's good grass cover there. It's not impeding the water in any sense of the word. It's letting the water flow on through, but there's no erosion. If you can see the water there, it's clear. There's no mud in it. There's no erosion taking place. And just a perfect amount of vegetation in that ditch. Uh, the flow line of that ditch, that's in a low flow area, but if you notice it's considerably wider, it covers most of the picture there, but in high flow areas there's still plenty of good vegetation along that flow line to keep erosion from occurring. This is an example of what really a, a grass ditch should look like. Here's really a serious problem in some areas of, of the country. We have very, again, very unstable slopes in many parts of the uh, of the nation uh, in high, particularly high uh, water areas or high rainfall areas, excuse me, but uh, it's letting the maintenance people, whether they're contract maintenance or whether they're state forces, it's letting them get on those saturated slopes or wet slopes while they're still uh, uh, very, very soft. This tractor here is pulling the mower across it, but uh, notice what the tractor can do in this sketch. He can cause tire tracks, he can cause uh, tire prints, the mower can cause rutting in the side of the embankment. Look at this one. It's totally crisscrossed with uh, mower tracks and uh, tractor tracks. Water stands in these ruts, by the way, continuing to soften, particularly the top few inches of that slope, the top embankment, and uh, can cause shallow slumps, if nothing else, in that slope. Cause the soil and, and the, uh, the sod, I should say, to break and let water down into that embankment. 
There's another example of a slope that is. Notice in one place here to the right center of your picture, there's water actually standing in one of those ruts. And so it's a very, very serious problem in some areas of the country. So maintenance people should uh, stay off of these slopes while it's wet, if possible, and to prevent this sort of thing taking place. Here's another very poor example. As a matter of fact, this is the beginning of a landslide. I suspect that that was caused in part, or if not completely, by the fact that those mowing tracks were on that uh, very fragile slope, and you see an escarpment starting there and a small bulge at the bottom, probably from mowing practices. Now, rock falls, which we've talked about several times this morning, let's see what maintenance can do with them. Oftentimes, uh, these things are very difficult to repair. Uh, rock falls are something that oftentimes large rock falls are, are beyond the scope of maintenance, but if it's a continuing problem of debris falling on a roadway, if it's a continuing problem at one location, uh, maintenance can do some things about it. For instance, uh, this slide shows a large crack in, in a large cut here. Uh, this is, goes back to the inventory that we talked about a few minutes ago. Maintenance people should be aware of these types of locations and kind of note these things that there's a possibility, a very real possibility, that that uh, large crack is going to cause some large boulders to fall off in the future. Maybe another winter or another season and uh, they may have a serious problem here. Probably at the moment, unless uh, doing anything about that may be beyond the scope of most maintenance forces, small maintenance forces, but at least they need to be aware of it. And uh, here's a crack in a wall. That's going to one of these days before uh, too many seasons, that's going to be a, a failure. As a matter of fact, uh, this one did fail. Uh, unfortunately, that slide doesn't show, but it did fail. There are some things that, uh, that can happen here that we can do, maintenance can do, not so much from, at least in the beginning, from stabilizing the slopes, but from protection more than anything. Notice in this slide here, the uh, wall is screened. It has a screen on it to prevent debris from falling down on the roadway. Uh, also, there is a zone there to tow that slope that the debris, if there's any falls out from under that screen, there's an area there with some, uh, uh, some width there to let the debris fall in. Also, there is a, a small berm there, a rock berm, a wire field baskets there that help to prevent the debris from bouncing up onto the roadway. These are important. These are things that maintenance can do. Uh, rock fall area here, a barrier which can be used. To, there are different types of barriers. Tom will talk about them some more in detail later this afternoon. But here's a, just an example of a fence that's been constructed to keep the debris off from the slope from falling out onto the roadway. And the other thing that I want to emphasize in this part for maintenance, and this is the most critical part for them, is just simply to keep fallen debris cleaned up. Uh, keep it out of the ditches and to rent uh, water from ponding. And if there is a slope that continues to present problems, uh, once in a while coming out and scaling these slopes, that is, by that I mean uh, cleaning off the uh, loose rock and the debris that's about to fall. We see in this uh, frame here, uh, our maintenance crew out scaling uh, badly weathered slope. And this needs to be done as frequently as the crew foreman thinks is important or is, is necessary. So that's mainly what maintenance can do in rock fall areas. But if you're uh, cleaning a slope uh, or you're scaling a slope, uh, one thing, there's a right way and a wrong way of doing it. And particularly as you see in this slide here, with the equipment that the maintenance crew has, they should not come in and undercut those harder overlayers as they clean those ditches out. As you see there at the lower left-hand part of the picture where it says incorrect, don't cut underneath that layer, but pretty much as it says there where it says correct, bring that slope down in a smooth grade, uh, leaving as much support as possible for that hard overlayer of rock there. Here's an example of a situation. This slope has been cleaned in the not too distant past. Notice it has been done pretty well. There are some... Uh, overhanging material there that may have weathered a little bit since the, the cleaning was done, but the point I want to il illustrate there is that poor material underneath, probably a shale, has been brought down pretty much at a straight angle and has pretty well been scaled. Irrigation is something that takes place in the western portion of the country, not so much in the east. Uh, uh, if there is irrigation that takes place, there are a couple of facts, just very quick facts that need to be remembered. Do not overwater. Even though it's important to keep vegetation growing, do not overwater 
the uh, vegetation but uh, and cause the slope to become totally saturated or if you've got a uh, irrigation system check the system out frequently for leaks or else you'll be saturating the embankment in one location and cause an inst instable situation there let's look at uh, for a moment at uh, maintenance of small slides uh, i think uh, though before we get into that we'll uh, just simp simply stop here our tape and we'll start a major topic here in just a minute take another break <coughs> Now we're under a section on sl uh, small slide maintenance. Now many of the slides that we've shown in this uh, workshop have been fairly sizable slides. Uh, uh, the reason we've done that is many people don't take pictures of small slides. They're not dramatic, so they're hard to find. But the principles that govern uh, in a small slide or a large slide are the same. So the principles that we're illustrating, regardless of whether it's a small or large, will still apply to what we're doing here. Uh, on small, small slide maintenance, if you have a, a small slide that does occur on some of your slopes uh, that's not major yet or something that uh, uh, maintenance people can handle, there are some do's and don'ts that we need to remember as we go through and, and uh, deal with these things. And some of these are, uh, uh, one of the most important is obviously to direct water away from the slide. Again, we're coming back to this old thing of water. We've got to hit it again. Keep water away from the slide. This little sketch we've shown here, if you've got a paved ditch that the slide has uh, flowed over and partially blocked, if you can clean that ditch or move the ditch some way, Tom mentioned that earlier this morning, and keep the water from running into the toe of that slide and continuing to saturate it, you are uh, helping your situation out a whole lot by keeping that toe as dry as possible. There's just another sketch illustrating the same thing. If you've got a... Uh, a pipe or if you've got a ditch at the top of a roadway that's putting water down into an unstable area that needs to be moved some way either run the water on or else change the direction of the flow at a new ditch or a new pipe and change the direction some way to avoid that uh, little sl small unstable area here's a bad situation here notice this landslide there's a real good clue as to what happened to that particular site there's about a four inch pvc pipe that's run right out into the middle of it uh, so there's a good reason there, that, uh, or a good thought there, that possibly that slide was caused by that pipe. That should never have been permitted, by the way. That was a private pipe that came out onto the uh, highway's right-of-way. So uh, that is obviously something that maintenance can take care of and uh, remove. If you've got any cracks, uh, uh, tension cracks from a slide or an unstable area, uh, these things ought to be sealed. It is amazing, and Tom will probably mention this later this afternoon, but it is amazing how much pressure or force just a little bit of water in a tension crack can put on that slide. Uh, it is a tremendous amount of pressure. Not only does it put pressure on the slide, but it also helps to saturate that failure plane as it seeps down into it. So if there are cracks that have occurred, by all means, it's very important for maintenance people as much as possible to keep those things sealed and filled up. If you've got a, a small area, we've talked to some maintenance people around the country, maintenance supervisors, and we have asked them what is one of the first things you do if you've got a small slide, and they almost entirely, the first thing they'll say is, if I've got material available, I'll try to flatten the slope. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that if you don't uh, interrupt the drainage from that slope, or if you don't, uh, uh, you know, create, if you've got the right of way in the area to do it, uh, then try to waste the material at the toe of the slope. Let's not, uh, we want to emphasize that it should not be at the top of it, but at the toe of the slope. That's where the support is needed and uh, it's important to remember that. So that's not a bad idea. A matter of fact, it's probably cheap in many cases if it's a small area and you've got a small uh, crew uh, to just simply waste stuff at the toe of the slope. And again, I emphasize at the toe. Now, uh, another thing you can do in a small, very small slide, a maintenance people can do is you as you see here in the sketch, and simply just remove the bad material. If it's not a deep uh, failure, if it's not uh, 
down uh, several tens of feet deep, if it's just mostly a slough on the slope, you can remove it. Oftentimes, uh, just simply a few, a few inches or a few feet below the uh, uh, extent of the sod. Remove that and uh, replace it. Here's an example of where that's been done. They haven't completely or completed uh, repair of this, but notice half of it at least has been repaired. They've simply removed that and have taken the bad material and back uh, filled it with some large granular uh, material. That's a very cheap solution, very easy to do in small shallow slides as shown here. Uh, some other things that you should not do, and I've mentioned them already, but don't excavate the toe of the slope. Don't remove any kind of lateral support. And obviously, don't pond water around the slide anywhere or unstable area if you've got one. And don't load the top of the field. And I've got that in capital letters. Don't load the top of the field. It's called side casting, I think, in that little yellow handout. Don't do that. That's the worst thing you can do. Putting material at the top of the slope here only adds to the driving forces that Tom discussed earlier in the course. Only adds to it and makes the situation worse. Obviously, it's a good place to dump waste material if you're cleaning ditches or so forth but you're just creating another problem somewhere else. The little dashed line there in that sketch indicates the possibility of a failure plane developing there. Here's an example of some side casting that's done. As a matter of fact, this is even worse. It's right inside the guardrail. They haven't even bothered to remove it outside the guardrail. I'm not going to show you any further where that one was. Uh, here's another bad example uh, of what not to do. I've seen in many places around the country where people have tried to repair landslides by just simply dumping it over the top. Just putting, if you've got a slough that starts, they'll come in with granular material. They've tried that with granular material. I think there's also a dump there, it looks like, but uh, of trash and everything else. But they've tried to repair that. Uh, you notice the edge of the pavement over here to the left, and they've simply dumped in granular material. Well, that's not helping them very much by putting it there at the top of the slope. Here's another example of some things that should not be done. We recognize, or well, maybe I should back that up just a minute. It's not helping you in any way to, when you uh, repair, try to repair a slide by continuing to pave it. Again, we recognize that maintenance must keep the roadway open by patching it, and that is a, a concern to keep the roadway open. But when we do this, we, of course, are adding more and more weight to the driving side of the landslide and creating more problems, and eventually something will have to be done more permanently. Here's another example of the same kind of a situation where many feet uh, have been added. There have been... I've heard examples of stories of much as 26 feet of asphalt in some cases have been added over the years to a landslide to the top of it where maintenance has come in and had to continually keep the road open and put more asphalt in. Uh, so that can really add up to a weight. There's another smaller example of the same type of situation. Question? Yes. When you're flattening a slope, mm -hmm. uh, a small one, are you recommending that they strip the existing topsoil and vegetation and key the slope? Um, most of the cases that probably would be best to do. Uh, I would agree that it would be best to do, but a lot of times it's not done. And uh, if the uh, material is added to the toe of it, and it's, it is a small slide, I don't think that it would you know, be uh, too harmful if you just simply uh, put it at the toe and dumped it there. Uh, is there any other, anybody else want to comment on that? you agree or disagree with that? Well, yes. Other, yeah. point, David, mm -hmm. I just thought was that to talk about side casting, and, and we've emphasized that. And I think if you, if you, um, if nothing else comes out of the course, and you recognize the side casting is a is a bad thing, that's that's great. But one thing I was thinking in in the areas where you do have problems with your embankments and also your cuts. Uh, you clean out the ditches, you can cure two problems. So you go out and take, you clean out the ditches and that material, instead of casting on the side, you take it down to the bottom and put the berms like you're talking about. So it's really economical to, to, to cure two problems. Sure. Uh, Richard, did that uh, pretty well answer yeah, the I'm question? Yeah, I was wondering what you were recommending. Mm -hmm. yeah. Question. All right. Let's go to drainage and maintaining drainage then. Uh, in developing this course, we had some uh, discussion as to the proper location for these, and uh, we kind of came to the conclusion, and you may have been able to organize it a little bit differently, but we came to the conclusion that probably the best place to put surface drainage would be under maintenance practices, because we feel that most of the time maintenance is more concerned with surface drainage than they possibly would be with under our subsurface drainage. 
So uh, we will discuss mostly here surface drainage and just briefly touch on subsurface drainage. And, but later in the afternoon, Tom will discuss subsurface drainage more in more detail. Uh, surface drainage uh, is uh, located in page uh, 88, or actually page 79, excuse me, in your uh, manual. Now, surface water is obviously uh, very important in where it goes and what we do with it. Uh, again, I told you earlier about uh, blocking of culverts. Culverts blocked uh, that do not let water flow properly and back up near the toll of embankments are problems. Here's an example here of a culvert that needs to be cleaned out. This is debris in front of a very large culvert. Uh, the uh, driftwood and so forth needs to be cleaned away, but when you do that, do better than this crew did. Notice where they put the, the uh, debris, they put it right back on the bank where high water will wash it right back where it was. So when you uh, clean out a culvert and clean the debris away, make sure that you carry it away and keep it out of the uh, pattern of flow and clean it completely out. Here's an example of, there's a head wall in that picture. It's a dark picture in the shadow, but you can see a head wall there. Somewhere under that debris, there probably is a culvert. And uh, that, of course, needs to very simply be cleaned out, cleaned away. Uh, ponding water in a, in a ditch, again, we've been talked about that numerous times, but any debris, whether it's vegetation, whether it's rock, whether it's soil or whatever it might be, the first thing is to get it out get it away and move it away from the flow pattern of the water so that it doesn't wash back down into the channel. Here's some, in an urban area, here's some debris, just trash and uh, grass, vegetation. Vegetation, mown vegetation is, is a very uh, big contributor to uh, debris in ditches, uh, particularly paved ditches. Here's another urban shot of just junk from a shopping center that's flowed down into at the toe of a slope or in a paved channel and it won't be long before that culvert is completely blocked and saturating the toe of the slope. Underneath, you can see there, at the right lower portion of the picture, there's a paved ditch there. And at the end of that paved ditch somewhere, there's a drain. As you can see, the washing and the debris and the trash uh, has totally blocked that, and I'm surprised that paved channel is flowing as well as it is. Apparently, it is still working some. But of course, that needs to be cleaned out and maintained uh, quite frequently, all of the trash removed. Here's one that maintenance must keep uh, on top of all of the time. Again, just trash in the ditch, in the flow line, backing up water. If that, if that doesn't saturate your embankment, it at least probably is saturating a portion of your subgrade, which is not a part of this course, but it is a problem. Uh, pipes in uh, unstable areas or is something that needs to be uh, have special attention paid to it. Uh, any pipe that has a joint that's set or separated, it's going to permit water again. Like a paved ditch, it's going to permit water to flow underneath that. It's going to do one of two things. It's going to erode out around the pipe, and if it's toward the end of the culvert, it's going to, you're going to lose that section possibly, or else it's simply going to saturate the foundation or saturate the embankment, and again, uh, provide a source of moisture and for uh, the soil to weaken and cause possibly a landslide. Here's an perfect example of a separated pipe joint. Notice the roots that are growing down in it. Uh, if there's a lot of water that's in that embankment, it can easily erode uh, some of the soil around that pipe down into the pipe. And Tom showed you a quick example of that a while ago in another slide. And uh, that should never, that should always be taken care of. Those joints should be sealed. And there are different ways to seal those depending on how far apart they're set, uh, separated. You can come in with grout or you can come in with the uh, uh, bituminous material, you can do other things to seal those joints, but they should definitely be sealed at all uh, cost. A pipe in an unstable area, a rigid pipe, particularly in an unstable area, is a source of problems uh, that maintenance should be aware of. If there is movement, that pipe, that rigid pipe, cannot take movement very well without separating at the joints, and when you get a joint separated, again, you've got water saturating your uh, or your foundation, or whatever. Notice this situation here. This is uh, the pipe in the distance there. The section in the distance has settled relative to the pipe in the foreground, the immediate foreground. You've got soil, you've got grass roots, and everything coming into your culvert. Probably the water that's flowing through this is flowing out into the embankment or into the foundation, giving you some problems in soft areas. Here's one that maintenance should be aware of. Don't uh, ever 
try to uh, put in pipe two different size pipes. That's what happened here. You notice the pipe section in the foreground is much larger than the one in the, in the next section on down. Not only do we have water, we've got roots and grass and everything else coming into this. This is a perfect source for water, for not water, but soil to erode around that smaller pipe and come into your larger section here. So uh, maintenance, when they try to repair pipe, of course, that's a very simple rule, but always at least use the proper size pipe when you're uh, trying to repair it. Inlets and outlets ought to be uh, protected very carefully. And this is a very simple, uh, again, rule. Everybody knows that, but we don't always pay attention to it. Uh, where water flows out of a culvert or water flows into a culvert, there need to be head walls around them by all means. If there's a head wall problem, if one is deteriorated, it ought to be replaced. This is a pipe here that fills the screen mostly, but you can see that it has no head wall. There's erosion that's occurring around that pipe. There definitely should be a head wall and probably a, a paved flume or a gravel or a large stone uh, trench that uh, takes the water away from the outlet here. Here's a small one. Now that looks like a small problem actually to maintenance. Uh, you could say, well, that's not going to cause too much trouble, but notice that a very small pipe, how large is the area that's eroded around it? There's no head wall there, no protection or no uh, gravel at all. That ought to be taken care of, uh, probably with gravel or with a little bit of concrete to keep that uh, eroded area from working its way up the slope or up the side of the slope. Uh, a short pipe that empties on the slope, this is some that I've seen in many cases, uh, a pipe that just simply comes out in this case, this slide here shows underneath the pavement, but I've seen many drainage structures where the pipe simply comes out on the side of the embankment, dumping water out onto the slope, saturating or eroding the slope. That's another thing that maintenance should be aware of. If we install a pipe, if we repair a pipe, why not increase the length of that pipe until it runs away from the slope completely and on out beyond the toe? And when you're cleaning ditches, over excavation of the ditch, and I mentioned this briefly in, in uh, uh, talking about scaling rock slopes, but the, the same thing holds true for soil ditches. If we're, over ex or if we're excavating the ditch, let's not over excavate it and undercut again the support of the cut slope. You notice here uh, uh, where I've got sketched here, ponded water in the ditch where it's been over excavated, it can soften the slope if it uh, has been undercut any or else if the water ponds in the ditch, it can saturate the embankment, causing a slide in more than one area, at the toe of the uh, cut slope or at the toe of the fill slope either. Here's an example of somebody that's uh, cutting out a ditch. Notice I uh, wanted to point out something in this uh, photograph here. They're doing a pretty good job, actually. They're cutting their, a rather uh, smooth-sided ditch. Notice that off to the right of the slide, uh, the photograph there, the uh, side of the bank that they're cutting there is very smooth, it's not undercut, and they're really doing a pretty good job. Uh, maybe the safety people wouldn't appreciate that ditch being so close to the shoulder, but uh, nonetheless the shape of the ditch and everything that they're doing here appears to be pretty good. <clears throat> Other things in drainage that we don't think about often that we can use to uh, maintenance can use very cheaply. If we've got ditches that are eroding, or ditches that we have continuous problems with, uh, things as such as ditch checks uh, can be used. Uh, this, in this case, is just simply a, a small gravel uh, berm or a small gravel dam is being used to slow the velocity of the water down. These can be used very, very cheaply in ditches and kind of create small pools where the velocity of the water is slower. One thing in, in, in ditches, and it's very important for maintenance people to realize, when they are cleaning ditches or when they're working with ditches, do not change, if possible, do not change the shape of the ditch. Anytime there's a change in the shape of the ditch, you change the velocity of the water. And whenever you change the velocity of the water, you're either going to get siltation or you're going to get erosion, depending on how the, change, the shape change is. So as much as possible, maintenance people should keep the ditch shape uniform throughout the entire length of the ditch to avoid any kind of change in water velocity. Uh, here's another example of a ditch check to reduce the flow or the velocity of the water. This is uh, an asphalt one. They've just created small steps in that ditch and uh, are doing a very effective job. Here's one that's rather interesting. It's from the slide. It's difficult to see the shape, but uh, uh, it's, there are small asphalt dams in that uh, ditch there. That's a paved ditch, and there are small 
asphalt dams there that are creating little pools of water that slow the velocity of the water. I think that's a very, very clever and very cheap idea that maintenance can use. Here's something very simple. It's just simply a, a silt check or a silt fence, if you want to call it that. Now, I suspect that's not a very permanent solution, and those silt fences wouldn't remain there very long. But if you're in an emergency situation and you're trying to slow the water and slow erosion, a silt fence would be a, a, a solution that would be temporary and could be used. Uh, again, uh, subsurface drainage, we won't talk much about this morning. We'll just move on to that very quickly. Uh, subsurface drainage uh, is something that uh, used to carry the water out of a landslide if it's in a slide area. Or if you've got pipes that you're trying to drain a certain area and you've got perforated pipe in it, it's always good to bury that pipe in a trench, backfill it with uh, gravel or geotextile that can be used to keep silt and mud from filling up your gravel ditch. These are things that can be used always. Here's just an example of how these are put in. Everybody's seen these type uh, drainage drains uh, put in. Very simple to install, something maintenance could do in a slide area if they're trying to drain uh, that or even collect surface water into a drain like that. Very simple to install. Any kind of drainage structure you've got ought to be repaired uh, and checked. If there are siphons, if there are manholes, if there are large pipes or whatever you've got uh, on your drainage system, these ought to be inspected frequently. Again, this is just, I just threw this slide in to show you uh, a rather complicated uh, structure to prevent uh, high velocity water from eroding out a particular trench or ditch. But these things ought to be checked. They ought to be kept clean and ought to uh, be aware of the fact that these things do need maintenance. We just simply can't forget about them. Another thing here uh, for maintenance, oftentimes they are required to uh, come in and uh, maybe repair a pavement or repair uh, a small section or patch something, and in so doing, they have to grade, regrade the slope. When you do that, uh, maintenance people should be aware of the fact that most pavements need some way of daylighting the water that gets into them. When I say daylighting, I mean to let the water get out to the side of it in some fashion. If edge drains aren't used, and they're being used often on many high-type highways now, but if edge drains aren't being used on small county roads, and most of them don't have them, then when you regrade the slopes, provide a means of escape for the water out of the pavement. The pavement's probably going to get water in it through cracks, through fissures, through joints, if it's an old concrete pavement. And when we regrade the slope, if you notice over to the right and over to the left of that pavement, that the soil there probably is pretty impermeable and it's going to uh, probably pond water. And either that water is going to saturate the slope at that point, maybe create a small slide, or else if nothing else, it's going to keep these subgrade saturated. So uh, running the gravel or a permeable gravel out to the edge of the slope probably is the best solution. Don't build, as it's called in this slide, a bathtub situation where the impermeable soil at the edge of the pavement keeps that water from draining away very quickly. Here's just an example of a, a bathtub situation. Notice the water that's coming out of that median. It has no place to go, so it comes, simply comes out onto the pavement there, as you can see, just to the right or the center of the picture, coming out on the pavement, probably running through the cracks in that pavement and down into the subgrade. Maintenance around uh, structures, and uh, in specific, uh, specifically I'm talking about uh, bridges at this point for there most of the time are most important structures that we have. 